Welcome to Startup TV Boston. I'm Michael McCarthy, and I would like to welcome my co-host, Johan Bergman. Thank you very much, Michael. And my guests, Hanna. Thank you. And Gia. Thank you. Startup TV Boston was started a few years ago for my Harvard Extension students in the Entrepreneurship and Innovation class who wanted to go further after the semester but weren't sure where to go. Once the semester ended, the startups that they had started didn't have any support. I wanted to support them by starting Startup TV Boston so that they could tape their pitch and the explanation of what their projects were so that they could then email them to angel investors and venture capitalists around the world for funding. Now the show has grown and has morphed even bigger where now we have a focus towards social entrepreneurship. And I've asked Johan Bergman to be my co-host and Johan's going to tell you what he does in the social entrepreneurship space. Johan? Thank you very much, Michael. So, um, as Michael said, my name is Johan Bergman and I'm the Director of Strategic Alliances for the Hulk Prize Foundation. The Hulk Prize exists um, to solve some of the world's largest issues, such as access to clean water, access to food and access to education, uh, because we believe that the governments of the world have not succeeded in creating sustainable solutions to these issues. So we instead leverage some of the smartest and brightest minds on this planet to create uh, innovative businesses to solve these issues. And uh, Gia and Hannah are some of the fantastic students we have the privilege of working with this year within our Refugee Challenge. And can you share with us a little bit about the Refugee Challenge and this year's prize? Absolutely. So um, the Refugee Challenge uh, this year is one of our boldest and biggest yet. Um, because every year we publish a challenge uh, around the world to university students that challenges uh, students from over a hundred different countries to create sustainable solutions to big, uh, big humanitarian and social issues. Um, this year it's about helping 10 million refugees restore their rights and dignity uh, before the year 2022, so a very, very bold target. And at the end of the competition, one of the startups, so potentially uh, Roshni Rides who we have with us here today, <laughs> will go on to win a million US dollars as seed money. Um, so that's what, we're, uh, that's what we're aiming for. And how many people applied for the million dollar prize this year? So this year, Michael, was a record year for us. We had 50,000 students from 100 different countries apply for, this, uh, for, the, for the competition. Um, and working tirelessly from the campus level through many levels of competition uh, on to now the accelerator that we're running here in Cambridge uh, with, with Gia and, and uh, Hannah and uh, the other teams. And how many finalists are there left? So this year we have, uh, based on the fantastic quality of the startups that we had, we decided to take in uh, a full eight teams to the accelerator program. Um, so uh, we're hard at work, um, you know, around the corner from here, leveraging the expertise of the Holt Prize network from around the globe to help these, um, you know, entrepreneurs take their ideas and make them reality and make them investment ready by September 16 when they're pitching at the United Nations in New York. And your finalists? Yes. <laughs> wow, <laughs> out of 50,000. Yeah, that's excellent. <laughs> One of eight around the world. So. How does that feel? Um, I think it was really overwhelming at first. We kind of um, thought about it much like a case study competition or a really theoretical approach. And although we put like 110% into it, when we actually won in Boston, um, the reality of a million dollars in investment money and actually incorporating um, kind of sunk in and we're like, oh my gosh, we really have to do this for real. So it was overwhelming at first, but now it's very exciting. Excellent. So what is, what is your project? What are you doing? So Roshni Rides is a solar-powered electric rickshaw service that strives to bring transportation solutions to refugee communities. Um, displaced populations oftentimes don't have access to safe uh, or quality transportation that can either be affordable, close to home, or really not that time consuming. So we're really focusing in on one population in Orangi Town, Pakistan, where we've actually been piloting for the last six weeks after raising around $30,000 in order to make this happen. So you've already raised $30,000. Yes. Excellent. And for our 
American viewers, what in your in your what is your definition of a rickshaw? What what is a rickshaw in your definition in Pakistan? Um, a rickshaw is kind of like a golf cart sized um, vehicle, <clears throat> and it's something that's a really easily an easy form of transportation for individuals in Pakistan. Um, it's it's kind of like a hop on hop off type system where people can just wave them down, kind of like a, a taxi in Manhattan. I see. So. Uh, a rickshaw is not like in Japan where you have a, a two-seater buggy where a human is pulling it. Yes. This is actually an electric operated golf cart that holds multiple people. Yes. So most rickshaws in these communities are actually auto-powered and they use petroleum or CNG. At Roshni Rides, we believe that renewable energy is the future and actually can drive down costs, which is why we've looked at electric solar-powered vehicles. I see. And where did the name Roshni Rides come from? How did you come up with the name? Um, so Roshni is actually a word in Urdu. It means radiance or a light or um, like sunlight. So that's kind of how we coined in um, with, you know, using solar energy and Roshni, the word Roshni as well. I see. So in Pakistan, if people understand Urdu, they'll understand that this name is like ray of light rides or sunshine rides. Yeah, so absolutely. The, the solar will be understandable. And it's not only that, but our team and the two other members of our team who couldn't be here today, we're all four of us are Pakistani American. And so having Roshni rides be a product of our own aspirations and really um, our identities is just another way to really connect the business back to us. Great, okay. So today's session is going to be, I gave you a choice. Uh, we wanted to learn about your project. We'd love to see your pitch in a minute. And then afterwards, typically, we give our guests the option of, would you like questions that venture capitalists typ typically ask, or would you like to really roll the dice and have a coaching session where you share with us your current challenges to make you an even better candidate to win the million dollars? And which one did you choose for this evening? Um, we decided to go for the coaching session because we're in it to win it. So excellent! It's more fun for us. <laughs> okay, could we could we start and take a look at your pitch and have the our viewing public understand a little bit more about what you're doing? Absolutely. Excellent. Right. So, so we begin. We are Roshni Rides, and our tagline is: "We're here to create brighter lives, one ride at a time." So our story today starts with Nasreen, a refugee who was forced to flee her home due to war and poverty. As a refugee, Nasreen faces several problems, but the biggest hurdle for her is to find a way to actually leave her settlement so that she can access different resources like healthcare, education, and employment. When it comes to transportation, Nasreen faces three big problems, cost, time, and distance. 30% of Nasreen's income goes to transportation, as compared to the 3.9% of the average American. Auto rickshaws, the local three-wheeled taxi service, often inflate their rates and buses fluctuate their pricing. And owning a personal vehicle is too expensive, so Nasreen is out of options. She can also spend up to two hours trying to get to any destination on a daily basis, often taking multiple forms of transportation. For Nasreen, the closest bus stop or location to where an auto rickshaw can pick up passengers can be anywhere from a 3 to 12 kilometer walk away from her home. And Nisreen isn't alone. She's one of 860 million refugees. A lack of transportation creates a barrier between Nisreen and refugees like her to be self-sufficient. At Roshni Rides, we believe that displaced populations lose their dignity when they lose self-sufficiency. There is currently an $82.2 million market for a public transportation system that can help to dis populations in Pakistan alone. That's where Roshni Rides comes in. Roshni Rides is revolutionizing the way refugees think about their own life. Our solar-powered e-rickshaw service is a public transportation system that is cheaper, faster, and more accessible than any other system in Pakistan today. It's a solution that can help Nasreen go from surviving to thriving. The solution has four facets, power, the e-rickshaw, service, and recharge. We collect power using the world's most available resource, the sun. We've decided to use the solar energy due to its low operational cost and higher efficiency as compared to the fossil fuels typically used. The solar panels will capture and store energy into battery banks. These battery banks control consistent energy production and will power the batteries for our e-rickshaws. 
We will be connecting refugees to our e-rickshaws using our supplier partner, Zar Motors. We will set up a lease-to-own program for drivers, encouraging entrepreneurship. Under the Roshni Ride system, electric rickshaws are a cheaper, efficient, and more strategic option to own and operate a vehicle as compared to the standard auto rickshaw. The heart of our solution comes in the form of a structured service. Roshni Rides operates on a route system inspired by the Manhattan subway system. Let's say Nasreen wants to take a Roshni Ride. Roshni stops are placed closer to her home, shortening the distance she would have to walk. She would buy a preloaded Roshni card from one of our drivers at a flat fee that she can afford, effectively cutting her transportation costs. Nasreen can now go and cut off at one of our strategically placed stops and reach her destination in half the time it would take her on a bus or an auto rickshaw. With this strategy, we have solved Nasreen's problems of distance, time, and costs. Last is recharge. Our drivers would come to our Roshni sta stations, which can be compared to the traditional gas station. However, instead of paying for gas, our drivers would swap their batteries for a new set or recharge. Due to rewiring innovations, we've reduced battery swap times from one hour to six minutes. For every rickshaw, Roshni Rides makes a revenue of $5 a day with a cost of $3.60 a day, giving us a profit of $1.40 a day. Under this model, Roshni Rides will break even by year three. According to our market criteria of cities with high amounts of urbanized refugees or informal settlements and low amounts of public transportation, we've identified several locations where Roshni Rides is the ideal solution. One of those places is Orangi Town, Pakistan, where we've already raised over $30,000 to pilot our program for the last six weeks. Orangi is home to Nasreen and 2.5 million refugees. If New York City has 27,000 residents per square mile, in comparison, Orangi has 55,000. This community is special to us because as Pakistani Americans, Orangi is a part of our home. We anticipate serving 10 unique riders per trip per car. With 30 rickshaws on one route, we will be impacting 240 unique riders in one week alone of our first year. As we add to our fleet and cultivate entrepreneurship via our drivers, we project impacting 10 million by the year 2022. There are other people beyond just us who are invested in this idea who couldn't be here. We currently have a group of advisors from around the world with a diverse set of expertise. Partners who are ready to support us and our idea, and a team already operating on the ground in Arungi Town. With an investment of $1 million, Roshni Rides creates impact across every aspect of the value chain. In only our first year, we have created 170 jobs, connected 500,000 re refugees to major resources, cut their transportation expense by 50%, and returned 547 hours a year per person. That's 23 days that Roshni Rides just gave back. Self-sufficiency is the key to individual empowerment, and self-sufficiency is the opportunity we are providing. Roshni Rides is the transportation solution through which dignity is restored to Nasreen and refugees like her. Their lives become brighter one ride at a time. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that with me. So it looks, it looks pretty perfect. What could you possibly need help with? <laughs> Um, well, that's really great to hear, but actually a lot of the criticism we've received in previous Pitch Fridays or judges or even advisors that have come to us in the whole Accelerator program is that we're trying to solve too much. To quote one of the judges from last Pitch Friday, he said that we're trying to boil to the ocean. And while I'd like to solve every single problem a refugee faces, I tend to agree with him that we need to kind of narrow our scope a little. And so what we would like some help with is how can we simplify our model Model or kind of break down the pieces so it's easier for people to understand that we're not trying to be a manufacturer and a distributor and a financer, but really we're trying to be a service that makes refugees' uh, lives easier via transportation. So let me get a little bit more information. When they say that you're trying to solve too many problems and be too many things, what exactly are they specifically referencing? 
So I think the first part is just the sourcing of the electric rickshaws themselves. We would have to be able to have a sourcing partner to bring those on board and then doing a lease to own program with our drivers. That means having a financing partner and arranging that. So looking at all of the manufacturing and the sourcing, that's almost another business altogether. It is. And then the third part is actually the recharge fee. So that's almost like operating like a gas station where we're having this battery swap or recharge fee that we're overseeing. And then the fourth component is the heart of the solution, which is the service part where we're regulating the routes and making sure we have a Roshni card and allowing our customers to get to their destinations in a safe, fast and affordable way. And so really we want to focus in on this service part and so a suggestion was made that maybe we should get rid of solar electric rickshaws altogether and hone in on this um, service strategy I'm, and I'm sure you can tell that that's a little bit of an alarming suggestion to us but one we have to seriously consider if that's best for the consumer. Why is getting rid of solar on the table? So the reason they want us to get rid of solar is because of the high cap X that comes with solar energy. So just to give you an idea, there's a high capital investment in solar panel cost, um, the actual hubs or creation, investing in batteries for the drivers, um, as well as just the rickshaws themselves. So something to keep in mind is that electric rickshaws are relatively new in these markets, which is a really um, awesome thing for us to consider to take advantage of and what we saw as an opportunity. But it also means that we can't take advantage of existing infrastructure if we have to be the ones who are introducing it to the market on a mass scale. Could you do it later? Yes, we certainly think that that's something that we want to phase in later on. But the thing is, we want to survive as a business in our initial years before we can even think about losing all of that money later on. If you drop the solar, <clears throat> you're going to lose the, the need to come up with all this money to do the solar. Is your end customer going to get worse service by not having solar power? We don't believe so. We think that we can still drive down our costs and provide a luxury service by actually talking to a separate manufacturer or even looking at the source of auto rickshaw drivers today. A really big issue with auto rickshaw drivers is that they can't afford to pay for maintenance because they don't know where to go for sourcing partners. So something we've discussed is why don't we provide or can have those opportunities to connect and have those auto drivers go from being independent entrepreneurs who are operating at a loss oftentimes or pay almost 50 50% of their daily income to the owner of the driver to becoming our employees. Well, let's just back up and do one thing at a time so, that, so that I don't get overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah. So let's just focus on the solar. Your, your energy source is solar and electricity and batteries versus a regular combustion engine with petrol or gas. Yes. If you use a different power source for the, for the rickshaws, is your customer going to suffer service in any manner, shape, or form by not having the solar? The only thing I would be, I would want to say that the solar, I guess not the only thing, the things that the solar energy adds to our business model, and Hannah, you can add to this um, if I'm missing anything, I think is A, uh, it makes our operational expenses very low over time because we're not having to worry about CNGs fluctuating prices or going back to petroleum users. Um, B, it's kind of cool, which is what's exciting mm -hmm. for consumers. It's this high-end type of service that they're not used to and really um, enjoy. But we believe we can bring high-end capabilities even through an auto rickshaw. And the third part of the solar energy is that it's renewable. So we're not contributing to CO2 gas emissions or pollution or um, really the poor air environment within this society or these settlements. And that was something that was a really good big add-on, I think, for us as well. Yeah, and using solar panels as well in terms of electric vehicles, there's also a lack of noise pollution. And so as we're on the ground right now and piloting, a lot of customers have actually told us like, hey, like not having so much noise when it comes to this rickshaw is actually a great aspect. Like we actually really enjoy riding in this vehicle because there's not so much noise, there's not so much, you know, like like it would for be an auto, an yeah. auto rickshaw. Yeah, so really what we're seeing the feedback from consumers is that they like the idea of this luxury ride. And um, we've kind of related, you know, today this year's challenge is to restore the dignity of 10 million refugees. And when we think of refugees or displaced populations, they don't have access to luxury anything. 
And why is that? Why can't we make luxury something that comes on a mass scale, even when it comes to transportation? So something for us to kind of figure out is can we, with the auto existing infrastructure, which is the auto rickshaw industry, can we bring this these high-end solutions? Can we eliminate noise or make a more comfortable arrangement with our auto rickshaws or with the drivers that we bring on, but then not even have to invest in the capex of solar energy? And maybe we think about that later on in the line. So those are some of the questions that we're struggling with. What do you think? Yeah, so, so I would like to just, because you, you talked about Nesreen initially, your customer, your kind of persona. I'm sure she, she's actually a real person. Um, when, when you talk to these people, what is it that they point out as some of their key issues with the current service? Is it you know, reliability? Is it noise pollution? What, what are the, the key problems that, that you're what you know looking to solve so the key problems is what we boiled it down to it's cost distance and time right so for example Nasreen is a real woman that we actually yeah. spoke to in Arungi and she hasn't left she doesn't she barely leaves her settlement and when we ask her why the biggest issue is because the transportation rickshaws that she needs to get to are too far away of a walk and she's on the older side um, it costs too much money she'd rather save that money for her household income and it takes too much time the two hours she spends trying to flag down a rickshaw or catch a bus to go anywhere and walk those distances she can be spending with her family or trying to gain income um, closer to home right okay so then so so she wants she wants really to have something more easily accessible both from a cost standpoint and from a absolutely standpoint. i think the biggest factor is convenience for a lot of these refugees a lot of the auto rickshaw drivers don't even come close to their communities a because they know that they can't afford um, their rates and b because they just don't want to travel there they'd rather circulate in areas where they know there's more middle to upper class people right right so 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 then so that's, that's uh, I think that's very interesting because you you were then talking about kind of this luxury service a little bit, but but thinking about you know how how is it that you is it your, so your, is your solution to this problem these routes that you're putting in? Yeah. So what we believe that our systemized route system optimizes um, ride sharing and it allows us to not only bring multi more customers on one route or to the destination that they need to reach it cuts down costs and it makes things faster so for example oftentimes what will happen is like let's say Hana needs to get to the marketplace and so do I when a rickshaw driver comes by they'll only take Hana even though we both need to go to the same place because Hana and I aren't communicating with each other and we're not both communicating with the rickshaw driver but what we've identified is selected stops that there's a lot of demand to go to and this will encourage or almost force everyone to opt participate in ride sharing and will increase the amount of customers a driver has per day. So right now the average of an auto rickshaw driver, they pick up six to eight customers per day. We believe we can double that to 12 to 15 just by using one route alone. So to stay organized, because you're getting into a lot of detail, which is all wonderful, but for us to be productive and of service to you, it's easier if we just take one issue yeah, get you an answer, go off to the next one. So let's get the solar nailed out. Uh, this whole project is in service of people who need to get to point A to point B faster and cheaper. Right. Do they care what the power source is of the vehicle? Do they care? I think at the end of the day, at the end of the day they really don't. Um, as long as it's something that's convenient that they can easily get to and that's affordable, I think that's right. what really comes down to it. Great answer. Yeah. So that would be, let's knock out the solar for now mm -hmm. because it is expensive. It's, it's a nice to have, it's not a must have. And to your point, it is a luxury and not so much the luxury of, oh great, it's solar, but I like the luxury of decreasing noise pollution, giving them a greater peace of mind. It's a quieter ride. And if that's going to be something really expensive that may stop you from starting your business or continuing your business, I would say put that into a longer term plan, but get going now, get that service, do the core, get the core goal met. I'm going to take you from A to B faster and cheaper. So right now I would say knock out the solar like the other person had recommended but keep that as a long-term goal, as an aspiration. And I would keep Roshni Ride as your name so that it reminds you that you know, maybe the, 
the light that you're looking for is you're lightening people's loads, you're lightening their burdens by bringing them farther, faster, cheaper. But in the back of your head, that also means solar, like it's, it's light for everything. So I would keep the name, but right now I'd start off with the, the least expensive, most viable way to, to fuel the vehicles. That really serves the core need. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think um, we've been coming up with like just trying to boil down the business model. And mm -hmm. um, actually this week was a lot about um, talking about market segmentation within the accelerator and like what is the direct need of the customer. And it is get to point A to point B or actually have even the ability to get from point A to point B. And the conversations we've been having as a team is um, do we really need solar energy to make that happen? Okay, so we've we've temporary. Well, we've uh, at this moment made the decision collectively that uh, solar will happen in our phase B, yeah. but initially it will not be that way. So we have that one knocked out. What's the next thing we can help you with that's on your mind? So if we got rid of solar and we're focusing solely on the um, service part, what we came up with as a strategy is how to make this a business model um, is we, what we talked about is partnering with the stops or the destination or resources that refugees typically want to access. For example, hospitals, colleges, schools, um, or employment centers that refugees really need to get to but aren't able to. And by partnering with them, we would create an A to B shuttle service. So it's still a route, but instead of thinking something that's circular that we don't feel like is going to be as successful with our research on the ground, it's more of an A to B back and forth destination. Now, when we thought about this, now we're kind of trying to think how can we almost, how do we own that model? How do we make ourselves proprietary over the routes and the augmenting of these services and how, what are our revenue streams look like? So what I'm sharing with you is an idea that we really just touched based on and haven't really spoken through, so maybe we can talk through it in this coaching session. The first one that pops to my mind is I love the fact that I could leave my house and go to a bus stop or a Roshni ride stop, and it's gonna bring me to the front door of the hospital or the college or, or the grocery store, wherever I need to go. But my first thought would be to charge the hospital, go to two hospitals and say, we're gonna have a Roshni ride stop at one hospital. There are two hospitals in this town. Who wants to bid on us? I would charge. So charge the partner. I would charge the partner where you're stopping. I would, char I would, I would have a bidding, do a bidding auction at every hospital and say, who wants it? And which grocery store wants it? Uh, which college wants it? And make that an income stream. What do you think? I, I think that makes a ton of sense. I mean, that's, that's kind of how we work with traffic on the internet, and so why wouldn't this be a great solution to that? But I would like to just understand a little bit uh, around kind of the, uh, the current flow of people. Like, how is the market behaving currently when it comes to how people drive uh, or ride with these, with these rickshaws? Is with it, the is auto it, rickshaw? Is it, is it more of a, you know, to a, to a sort of a... It's an on-demand service. Okay. So um, let's say you want to take uh, a rickshaw, you'll flag someone down and you'll tell them their destination, wherever it is, they'll take you. And based on actually how you look or how wealthy you appear right. and how far the destination is, they'll negotiate a price with you. So that's actually a really big problem is because there's no flat rate and all of the prices are always fluctuating. There's no consistency within the system or predictability for our consumers. So whenever they have to try to flag down a rickshaw driver to get to the hospital for emergency situations, a lot of the stories we've heard is that rickshaw drivers will actually inflate their prices by three or by four times the amount because if your dad's having a heart attack, you need to get to the hospital no matter what, but we're going to charge you about seven times the amount that you would have to pay originally because you have no choice. And so this already displaced population is being taken advantage of by entrepreneurs who really don't have any choice there on, on their own right because they're also poor peop displaced people as well. And are they succeeding? Are, are those businesses viable and profitable? They're actually, most of them are actually operating at a loss. So about 80% of auto rickshaw drivers um, in these populations, according to research, are um, rent out their rickshaws and they are paying fees to an owner. And 50% of their daily wages are going back to the owner. So they're not making any savings. They're actually operating at a loss, which is why we feel it would be strategic for Roshni Rides to actually employ these drivers and yeah. give them a sense of security, which is incentive to come onto our system. 
Right, so you become the 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 the, 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 the sort of the rickshaw drivers union yes, in a way. Yes, exactly. Now, if you do that, the yes. competitor is going to get pretty angry. Who, yes. Who's behind? Who, who's making all the money right now, so to speak? So, um, our, to our understanding, owners can be anywhere from uh, manufacturers to organized crime. So, uh, there's That's a variety. That's question. Exactly. <laughs> That's why I asked the question. Yeah. Okay. There is a variety of competitors when it comes to these situations, and we're working through mitigating the risks and all that. So, I mean, the biggest stra strategy would to be get some governmental officials to be supporting us, so that when it comes to uh, those other factors, uh, we have a good defense. Okay, so you're going to be competing with potentially organized crime, which obviously gets dangerous. Mm -hmm. So you could get protection from a government if this is government sponsored, or I'm not suggesting that you partner with people that are in organized crime, but if you gave them a more profitable solution to what they're doing now, I mean, right now it's really not working for them. Mm -hmm. So a great way would be why not come on to our system and we give you a cut of the money. And I know it's not partnering, but honestly, we can't avoid organized crime because that's really prevalent in almost every kind of refugee community or displaced population. It's a reality that I think any team or social enterprise trying to solve this issue is going to have to kind of look at and see how do we either help them become formalized, um, not in crime, but yeah. in a way that's mm -hmm. contributing to society, or um, you know, how do we mitigate that risk? So there's kind of two options there. Right, right. And do you guys see these routes that you're having as a way of, of differentiating yourself towards, you know, towards that goal? Yeah, so I think um, routes were established before, but they really weren't very successful in the way they were executed because I don't think that the people running them really understand how to uh, understood how to optimize the efficiency or had safe vehicles in place to work on those routes, um, or they didn't have the knowledge base to really look at their demand flows, which is something a strategy that I think our team brings to the table as for supply chain majors and people with supply chain and efficiency experience. Um, but uh, not only that, um, looking at this A to B shuttle service, some of those services are actually happening right now. So to give you an example, what's happening, like let's say for a school, um, let's say the Citizens Foundation has built a school, they'll arrange a shuttle service for their students specifically to go from point A to point B. And the factory will have arranged a shuttle service working with independent rickshaw drivers to arrange for their factory workers to come and do a pick and drop carpool service. But the issue is, is that this TCS service and these factory service drivers aren't speaking to each other or communicating. They might not even know that those shuttle services exist. So what about a system that is aggregating all of these um, services and making it standardized in a more efficient process? And that's kind of the direction that we're leaning towards, is helping all these services communicate, kind of creating that employee base of drivers and introducing a flat fee system through our Roshni cards. So ideally we would have um, kind of to walk you through the user journey that we're considering is somebody would come in, sign on as a Roshni member, get their Roshni card, and now they can access any one of our shuttle services and just pay like a flat fee to get from point A to point B. So it's cutting their costs. They know exactly where they're going and at the time that it's gonna take them to go because it's a shuttle service going back and forth. And now the shuttle services are all being optimized to the maximum efficiency because they're all communicating and we have the power to collect that data and give them, feed them the information that they need to be fed. Well, I haven't gotten past the organized crime competition <laughs> thing. Okay. Because if you're threatening to them and they vandalize your vehicles, they can just put you out of business. And I don't like the idea of partnering with them, but what I'm wondering is, is there enough business for this type of service where you could be so different that you wouldn't be impacting their business? You would be doing another piece of the market that you're not taking money away from them where they might not be threatened by you? Such as if, if they're already doing their route, doing their thing, and you just focused on like we go just to this hospital and just to this college and maybe like you brand the Roshni ride as we're we're a shut we're not really a taxi service we're a shuttle service to uh, these specific locations kind of like MIT in this area has the MIT bus Harvard has their own bus 
uh, some of the hospitals, Spalding Rehab, MGH, they have their own bus. And people don't see that as competitive with the city's bus service. I'm wondering if you can be different enough from their route and who you're appealing to their customers where they might not feel threatened by you. You are going to be taking some of their business. Right. So, so, so uh, I think that's a, that's a very good point, Michael, because, and, and I think something you already kind of addressed when you explained how it's currently working, because you were saying that in the uh, older areas of Orangi Town, for example, these, these rickshaws don't come. So, is there a way for you to, to leverage that kind of gap in the market where there is obviously demand, that demand might be kind of less um, you know, power to, to, to buy or less purchasing power, but how would you become profitable in that, in that space? Yeah, so I think to take your first point to um, really understand like organized crime, I think what from our research and just like kind of talking to people on the ground, the way the um, they're called the transportation mafia. The way they kind of work is they kind of have a claim to a route or a land. It's not really um, drivers or vehicles that they own. So basically, as long as we're not operating on their routes or what they feel is the optimal uh, profitable route for them, then I think we would be kind of in the safe zone and not of concern to them really. So what if we marry Johan's thought and what you just said, that imagine that this is, this perimeter is, is the route, the circular route that the transportation mafia likes. Mm -hmm. So you don't go on that route. But to Johan's point, let's say that there are areas outside that need service but aren't getting service. What if you brought them into the route where you're still providing a service that you're bringing them from a point A to a point B at a, an affordable rate. So you're still doing your service, but you're actually helping or not impacting at all the existing route that the mafia is using. I think that's a great compromise and a good way to avoid any violence or confrontation. Yeah. I, I don't necessarily want to help their business, but I would think that they would probably leave you alone if they called you up and said, what are you doing? And you could say, I'm bringing customers to your route. You don't, you don't go out this far, but I'm bringing them right into the, the circle of the city. I Perhaps you say, I operate in the suburbs, and you operate downtown. Uh, I'm, in a, I'm in an area that you're not servicing, and I'm bringing them to you. I'm actually bringing you customers. Yeah. That, might be, that might be something. Yeah. Like I say, I don't want to help them, but I don't want them to hurt you either. Yeah, I think we're doing still a lot of research about what they do, how they think, because a lot of it is hush-hush, it's organized crime. But... Yeah. Um, what they're operating on and you know how they've actually been able there's different um, even within transportation mafia there's different groups and how they've communicated with each other and been able to decide and obviously there are legal forms of transportation or services that are also operating and how they've been able to successfully penetrate the market for example Kareem which is an app based solution very similar to Uber and Uber as well they're also operating in the same vicinity so how you know how have they been able to be successful so those are kind of the patterns that we're looking at and if we can replicate their solves or the way that they've been able to kind of mitigate organized crime it's something that we would be able to go through as well I would encourage you to do your research and have a really good answer to that question because when you are there for the final night at the UN with the judges for the million dollars I would expect that question to come up and be ready for it. Absolutely. Okay. And I think we have some, some fairly decent solutions, not perfect, but I would say put it on the homework list of something to really, you know, shine that rough diamond, but definitely be able to answer the question, deal with the question, don't try to evade it, and give them a, a viable solution. And I think the fact that you could say there are other people outside the mafia that have transportation services, for example, Uber. And this is what we found, how they're able to mm -hmm. coexist with the shark in this ocean where we can continue to swim with them. Mm -hmm. So I think having, you know, just give a, give a realistic answer to it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Absolutely. What's next? Okay. Um, do you want to take it? I've been talking a lot. <laughs> um, I guess another issue that we've been kind of dealing with is just understanding and coming up with the proper solution for our transactions, so the yeah. payment itself. So we're just not sure if we should go about with using the Roshan, the Roshan card itself by using a QR, a QR scanner for the driver and having a preloaded card itself. Just because, you know, as we're on the ground and as we're talking to more people, the user education itself is something that's really hard for the customers to understand. So going out and purchasing a card, then getting it preloaded, the driver learning how to use the QR scanner, 
that's something that's really new to them. Mm. And I, we don't know if that's something that will kind of turn them off to using our, our service in general. So we're, we're just kind of going around and, and brainstorming different ideas of how we can come about um, a proper way that's to collect these payment transactions in a way that you know the users are able to understand and also something that won't put the driver at risk as well, which is why we originally went to the card itself because we wanted it to be cashless mm -hmm. so that the driver wouldn't be at risk. What do you think? No, I think the card is a, is a very interesting uh, sort of innovation in, in the space because for, from what I understand, cards are not widely used in transportation in Pakistan. And something that, you know, as you say, is always a hurdle is kind of the user education side of it. So, so you know, back again, what are, what are people using currently? Is it, is it only cash? Uh, it's it's using cash. Yeah. Is it just cash, yeah. basic cash. And then I, I, I also know that there is a you know, kind of widely used mobile money, yeah. uh, just cash or similar in Pakistan. How is that something that, that is applied to transportation as well? So we definitely um, debated the use of using SMS or smartphone because er, although there is a high penetration of phones in Pakistan as a as like a general population and the community that we're trying to service, which is Orangi, mm -hmm. there isn't. Um, from our research, uh, most families have one phone and if they do have a phone, it's SMS based only, it's not a smartphone. Or if they do have a smartphone, it's a really old edition and they don't really know how to use it properly. So the first tactic would they be really like, teach them how to use a phone or how to use a f smartphone if they have one and the next is only one person per family has it so not you've already lim you've limited your consumer base and even when we think about scaling we don't want to restrict ourselves to populations who have um, smartphone penetration rates looking a lot of communities in urbanized refugees in Africa as well or even in South America not everyone has smartphone penetration and if they do it's the same problem they don't really know how to use the smartphone to help them or um, don't want it they don't trust it to load their money and this is actually a cultural issue across Pakistan is people don't trust there's a reason e-commerce hasn't set off in right. Pakistan is because people don't trust invisible money. Right. They want the cash in their hand. Well, great feedback. That's great feedback. If that culture doesn't believe money other than the form of cold, hard cash, that's feedback for you. Mm -hmm. That maybe this, this whole card technology and the QR code, if culturally that community is not going to accept that, that could stop you in your tracks. So I think to Johan's point, what, if, what are people saying yes to now? My thought was, I understand you don't want to do cash because of the obvious reasons of robbery and, and, and all that, but what about what they just do in the U.S. on the low-tech side is just get a bus ticket, yeah. like, a, like a book of tickets or like a, book, a, a stamp of tickets, and you just do rip one out for each ride. Would that... So, yeah, the only thing was, it's like, how do we create a consistent flat fee? So with this pass, at least if I'm buying 10 rides, I know exactly the price I'm going to get because it'll be like 30 cents per ride or 30 rupees per ride or whatever price point we figure out. And that way, when the bus uh, or sorry the rickshaw driver scans it, they can't negotiate a price afterwards because they've already scanned it. They have their income coming in and whatnot. So. So walk me through a typical person using your system on a daily basis and how the pricing would go, and then I think we can come up with the how they're going to pay for it. So let's say I'm, I'm the person in Pakistan. Uh, I wake up in the morning, I want to go to work. I, I see a Roshni ride. Walk me through what happens. Okay, so you would purchase your preloaded card. Right now we have it from the driver. We anticipate phasing out to vendors eventually. So you, pre, you, you purchase your preloaded card from a driver. This is the first time you're using a Roshni service. You anticipate, okay, I think I'm going to be going on 15 rides this month. So you buy, let's say, the bronze package. Um, you pay it for all of your costs, and you have your bronze Roshni card. And so now you've paid for your next 15 rides. The driver takes it. It scans on a QR code, goes back to our validation data centers and um, whatnot, and the pricing, the money goes into our Roshni account where we will delegate the money later on. And so the, my flat rate, I'm going to pay that, let's say, a dollar to keep the, the this easy, that if I go from... Uh, stop one to stop two, that's a dollar. Yes. But if I ride it all the way around the entire route that you do, that's still a dollar. So we've actually changed it. So now, which was the initial discussion, which will be more of a shuttle service. So there's only one destination. You're going straight to your job, you're going straight to school, or you're going straight to a hospital. So that was kind of the 
frame rework we were thinking of if we're taking out this solar rickshaw part like how do we optimize routes and what the feedback that we're getting is is that this circular route really isn't working people don't want to wait and wait for a stop two three and four they want to get to their destination so we're looking at where's the demand for those destinations and creating more of a faster optimization that way. So let's say you're trying to get to work and your work is near like a city center of some sort where a lot of people need to get to all the time, that would be the stop. And then all of us, that's how we would optimize our shuttle service. So it's not like a route. Well, Uber is doing that with uh, the Uber ride sharing where your Uber pool, where you're pooling with other people. Let's say all of us are going to different places, but we're in the same car. What, what I've noticed that they'll do is it if I say I'm standing here, they'll say to me, please walk two blocks away and go get the car there. So they make me meet the car. Mm -hmm. Even though it's only a few blocks away, you might be, are you saying that you would do something similar that Johan needs to get to work, I need to get to work, and, and we're, we're, let's say, three blocks away from each other, and so you're going to stop in between our two buildings. Absolutely. That would be point A, and then point B would be, at like, let's say, um, in New York City, uh, Penn Station, there's a lot of companies right next to Penn Station. Penn Station would be, and it's a transportation hub, um, and so it would be another stop, and that way, all of a sudden, I've not only optimized the route through a shuttle service, but I've forced some side of ride sharing to drive costs down, optimize the route itself, and created a shorter distance because I placed the stop right next near your home, where before you had to, maybe the stop was closer to the middle of town where you had to walk farther distances. It's really cool that you could get me not from point A to point B, but the vicinity of point A to the vicinity of point B the the algorithm and technology on that is probably huge but that's where all the money would be i mean you would get bought out in, in a second by doing that one but that's that's a, that's its own business all on its own that is a big big thing yeah i love the idea but i'm wondering are you giving up the solar idea to pick up a whole nother <laughs> you know, technology yeah. project what what what, what kind of hits me is, is i might have misunderstood you but uh, the routes, would they be optimized on a customer basis or would they be a more of a set route that you decide and you maybe you keep it for, you know? It would be a set route so that we don't have to run into this app technology and it would be for now um, until we can afford an R&D team to maybe work on that technology for us. It was just looking at the demand of just customers coming to one location right. or another. And the patterns of these customers is off, or at least his play, is often the same. When even doing the interviews or talking to them, they really listed the same market, the same school that they all go to, the same um, like employment factories that they all work for. Like, they, you know, we were talking about factories and she was like, oh, we all, my son and this, her daughter and my neighbor, they actually all work for the same factory. That's what we were, we were talking about. And, you know, that was like, oh, okay, they're all going to the same market, the same factory, the same school. Well, I think now we've circled back to the, 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 the first idea earlier in the show, which I really liked, that you go to, the, say, to the hospital, you know, do you want our stop here? Exactly. Yeah. Subsidize That's, us a little I was, bit. I've been continuing to talk about the same thing. We probably got lost in the mix because yeah. I wish I had like a visual aid up here to kind of draw it out for you. It's the same idea. The, it's the hospital, the market, mm. the employment center. Those are the A to B stops. So mm. going back to the user journey, mm -hmm. let's say you need to get to a jo your job, right? Let's talk about employment because that's one of the biggest ads or value ads we would be providing. The city center or the stop we, we would choose would be an area that we think or a factory would be where most of this displaced population works or works near. So that would be the the, the, the part B. Okay, so that's your a. unique route. Yeah, yeah like. and that's the shuttle service going from point A to point B. And maybe it's the factory that we partner with. Mm -hmm. So a factory that employs most of this population. So we were, so okay, so we've, we've pretty much solved the, the route. It's a different route than what the competitors are doing and it's based on people wanting to really be at that spot because they're gonna be using that geographical area for hospitals, groceries, what have you. Now let's go to um, how you're gonna pay for the ride and is it gonna be, what is, what is your cashless system? So we have, you're, you're saying that the electronic stuff, the smart apps, et cetera, electronic money is not, people aren't really liking that one. 
and you don't want to do cash either. So a few other options we have are just straight old bus tickets or what about subway tokens like the, they did in New York City, just almost like coins. Mm -hmm. One coin per ride, and so where all would they get it from? How, who's going to be storing it? At least when you're going on the MTA, there's kind of like a physical barrier. You like have to put in your token or your card in order to make it to the subway. So it's kind of like at least when you've bought the card, every like everything's already paid for for we. So we've already kind of mitigated our risk there. But what if you, if the card is very similar to a token? One is just a piece of paper. The other is a little hard coin. You're going to have to go somewhere to have that card dispensed. Your coin could be dispensed the same way or just a straight ticket. When you get on the bus, you have to punch that card in somewhere or drop in a coin or give the bus driver a ticket. So how, how are they different in, from your perspective? So I guess what, uh, uh, what we're concerned about is um, maybe our drivers kind of finding a loophole and they'll take you on into their card and they'll charge you individually right. without actually the card purchase or scanning the card um, and they'll pocket all of the income rather than it coming to us. So we were trying to mitigate that and we thought that the card solution might help because it's a preloaded card and they have to pay for 15 okay. rides initially. Because the, There's card, a, yeah. the token is, could be like, is like a dollar. Mm -hmm. It could be abusing that form of currency. Yeah, but even with that, I mean, we've mitigated it to somewhat, but there is the question of can't the driver kind of find a loophole anyway? And, you know, the, the remark we got was that the MTA has a physical barrier to the subway. Yeah. You can't, and they have police monitoring it. So how do we kind of people, figure that people out? People jump that turnstile. Yeah. And I've seen two people go through it once before. I think you may want to think about, it doesn't have to be perfect, if you look at existing technologies such as Boston, New York City, Berlin, they have great services. They, I, if, if you modeled what they did and you go in front of the judges for the million dollars and say, we're using the system that New York City uses, this is what they do, even with all the problems that they have, I wouldn't get too innovative because you can get shot down for all these, all these negatives that you're already talking about, but if you say, listen, there's a status quo, there's a precedent that these major institutions, these major cities are already using this form of currency, and sure, they're not perfect, people are jumping turnstiles, uh, but overall, it works 98% of the time. That might, I would just encourage you not to get too perfectionist about mm -hmm. it, um, but you may also want to accept I mean, some risk mitigations, we were like video cameras, um, like having GPS trackers within the car, and also the fact that we really believe behavior change comes from treating the employees correctly. Like they don't have, and they're operating as individuals, they don't have this network, they don't have benefits. Um, a huge, actually from our pilot, a huge success we saw was, was with the employees, not the customer. And that was because, you know, we gave them t-shirts with our branding. They felt a part of the network and they were incentivized to work longer, work harder, and that's just, basic management theory you learn in school. What if they got a benefit, let's say an extra dollar at the end of the day, if they collected you know, 500 rides, 500 valid rides, let's, let's say we'll just stick with your card, your QR code or whatever it is that you like, and let's say that, okay, I, I could cheat the system, I could loophole it, but if I legitimately punch someone's ticket or whatever and I get 100 people or 200 people, I get a bonus for having more more people validly taken That's into the exactly system. That's exactly what we want to kind of put into the payments or like our cost structure is that there should be a minimum threshold that they're hitting and that no, no matter what, we would take that kind of cut from them so they b can either meet it and actually get the income that they need in order to survive and make a commission or a profit or if they're not hitting it, we're going to take it anyway. So that was an idea we toyed around with, but we're not really, you know, there's there could be some negative implications with that where we can't sell or the sales pitch to the driver itself or the employees doesn't become as strong. Well, but it does mitigate the risk in terms of our cost structure. Could we do the same thing of a low-tech solution in the beginning and then plan B would be a higher tech? Like your higher tech is, is you want to have these cards and then maybe you want to have these video cameras that are watching it and there's GPS trackers and all this wonderful tech stuff. Two issues come up. One is, does the cost of that, that technology knock out all the profits that you're making? You know, like is, is the burglar alarm so expensive that what's inside the house doesn't really matter? That's one. And I'm wondering if there would be a, 
just a lower tech solution. Like perhaps the minute, the minute someone walks onto the bus, like a bell rings and maybe there's a counter on that bell that, okay, hey, your bell rang a hundred times today, but I only have $85. $85. Mm -hmm. I should have a hundred dollars for a hundred bell rings. Something that maybe there's something that's really low tech that you couldn't get around. You know, like a turnstile. You know, when they when the, it was those old old fashioned three style uh, three prong turnstiles. That once the turnstile moves, there's a counter like an odometer that would count that once someone gets on the bus. Now you say to the driver, look, you started at zero. You had a hundred people go through that turnstile. Where's my hundred dollars? Mm -hmm. So maybe you're putting a turnstile into like a mini one into the rickshaw. I mean, we'd have to talk to a manufacturer. Yeah, and there's mean, like even you know maybe maybe smaller things. Maybe there is a maybe there is a mechanical sensor in the seats whenever when, whenever somebody sits down. You know that's a, but it, it should be since you're probably moving away from the actual manufacturing and 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 bringing in the. U you need something that's easy to implement, to put in place and implement. Yeah. yeah, I mean the idea is to kind of take auto rickshaws that are already have their infrastructure and everything, and kind of like already exist within the marketplace, and make them more successful. Right. That they would be um, an indirect beneficiary by becoming our employees and a part of our network, and we would maybe make some adjustments to their rickshaw, um, a part of their package or some right. sort. Of yeah, I'm guessing that this there must be a solution to this. I mean, there's so many different forms of transportation. This is definitely not reinventing the wheel. My guess is go to these manufacturers with this problem and say, hey, how do we make sure that we get a, a cashless safe system where all these concerns that we have aren't a problem? And my guess is that there are already solutions out there. I think this might be sort of like what your advisor was saying, that you're taking on too many things. You're, now we're sort of getting into what is the a security system for to make sure that people yeah. are being fair. Yeah. I'm guessing that there's probably a lot of existing solutions already. No. I mean, while we're piloting, we knew we couldn't make this happen with the Roshni card. We were like, we have six weeks to pilot, and we put the pilot together in four weeks. Um, so, you know, we, we like put together what our plan in like April, yeah. and mm -hmm. then we start and we launched in May. Mm -hmm. So, um, we've been operating with cash, and it's been fine. But when we scale or go to a mass, like the biggest thing is like right now we have a very personal relationship with our drivers, our employees. So they trust us and we trust them. We don't think that they're pocketing any of their income because of the transparency and just the personal relationship we've built. But you can't replicate that genuine relationship on a mass scale when I want to have a fleet of 30 to 60 cars operating underneath me to have this route or these you know, I wonder this if system if go. So we need to put um, like different kinds of mechanics in place. What if we did some kind of peer security where you have multiple drivers, let's say that we're all drivers, and right now you're on one route and you could steal all the money. You're on another route, you could steal the money. But what if during one route or one cycle of a day, we all drove the same bus? There's four of us on the same bus and we were all accountable at the end of the day that the proper amount of money needs to be there, whether it's the turnstile, let's say it's the turnstile cash model, to keep it super simple, that at the end of the day, I'm at the end of my shift, hey, I have to go in there with $100, and there were, my peers were on this bus driving, You're n are you really going to steal money from me? Mm. So like an honor system, yeah? Kind of like uh, yeah. Maybe. Responsibility. Yeah. I think perhaps like a peer, yeah. And then also plus a peer bonus that hey, if your if your books balance, if your cash matches the turnstile, then you all get a bonus collectively. And if it doesn't, if one of them messes up, then everyone Everybody loses matched. it. Yeah. There might be something in the peer in the peer thing. Oh, that's a good idea. That's not something we thought of, yeah. Because then it can also like collectively build that brand, build that community. You help. Which each is other exactly out. what our vision is. We right. really want to create. Like we, our envision was, you know, we want to be integrated into every community because we believe transportation transforms cities and communities. We think it happened in New York. Um, Boston is very similar. The T, the way hubways work with bicycling, it's really changed the entire, um, you know, the vibrancy of the community itself. So mm -hmm. I think that Roshni Rides is aiming to do the same thing for displaced communities. We're trying to create not only in innovation and commerce within these communities, but allowing them access to resources 
that's dignity on its own. You can, if I can get a girl to go to school and have the time of commute where she's saving an hour, where she could be studying or getting better grades or helping her family more out at home, that, that creates a ripple effect on its own and that's what we're trying to do. And on that note, we're out of time and I, <laughs> I think you have an amazing idea. We would like to invite you back on the show a year from now <laughs> to see where you are, regardless of what happens with the whole prize and I wish you all the luck in the world. Thank you so much. The whole prize is just one step in many steps, and I would do this regardless of what happens. But I think people need this, and I think that your, your heart's in the right place, and you can help 10 million people, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank you for being on the show. Everyone, thank you for joining us, and we will see you next time. Take care.